everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Q. Today, I am very excited to welcome Ben Gardner. He is the Director of Support at Drift. Thanks for being here, Ben. I'm excited to have you. Thanks, Meredith. Nice to be here. Yeah. Um, so today, we have an exciting topic. Uh, we're going to talk about how to expand a support organization from the you know Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 model to a 24-7 model. And we're going to break it down into five clear steps. So, Ben, I know that you have lots of experience with this, with expanding to 24-7. Um, and you've been in the process of, of doing this at Drift, right? Yeah. we uh, Currently, right now, we are implementing a 24-7 support model here, too. Nice. So this is very recent and relevant for you. <laughs> Um, so to get us started, can you just give me a quick overview of of what your five step process is? Yeah. So um, the first step, and it, to me, it's one of the most important ones, is just defining what twenty four seven support means for your organization and understanding why you're going to do it. Um, after you do that, you want to review what your current resources are that you have in your organization. Um, you're going to end up Number three is choosing a model, so figuring out exactly what type of 24-7 support you're going to have. Um, the fourth step here is probably also one of the more important ones. Is just, I said, communicate, communicate, communicate. Just make sure that you're sharing the information out to everybody. Uh, and then the last step um, in the execution is just reviewing what you have so that you can make any necessary changes. All right. Love that. Um, so let's dig into step one. So, and that's defining what 24-7 means for your organization and then why you're going to do it. So, can you just tell me what all is involved in that step, why it's important to start with that, um, and then how you go about executing that? Yeah, so um, really when you're thinking about defining what 24-7 support is, um, you need to understand what the benefit of that is going to be for your customers and for your company, and you need to know who those stakeholders are. Uh, you have to think about, is this related to a sales motion because you have new service packages? Um, is this something inside of your contracts that you provide for your customers? So you need to make sure you're adhering to that. Uh, and then overall, just what is that customer experience? Um, and then also defining what type of support you're going to do 24-7. Um, obviously, there is you know the idea of chat, phone, and email. And you have to figure out, am I going to do all of those 24-7, just some of them? And you know these are all key components in trying to figure out exactly what you're going to do. Uh, the reason why all of that is important, first and foremost, is just it's going to change what your structure looks like once you understand what that model is. Um, and it's going to drive the rest of the steps in this process so that you need to make sure that you can answer those questions up front. Um, typically speaking, and what I did here at Drift, the first thing you're going to want to do is just have a rough outline um, of what you're wanting to do, kind of having a key mission statement. Um, and then meeting with your internal stakeholders. I would advise, typically speaking, customer success sales, um, your actual support team, and then your legal HR team for any implications that you're going to have for just the, the steps you're going to take. Uh, and then make sure that you are including the what and why in that definition um, before you kind of go on to any of the next steps. You just need to make sure that everyone understands what you're trying to do. Okay. So when you were doing that at Drift, I'm curious, what was your what and your why? Um, big thing for us was the moving up into kind of an enterprise space. There's an expectation for providing support more around the clock and every day. Um, so we needed to look at how are we doing that for our customers. If you're selling into larger customers and organizations, then they're going to be on 24-7 themselves. So you need to have kind of a support structure that matched that. Okay. And then can you tell me a little bit more about um, about those stakeholders you were meeting with and then why why you wanted to make sure those teams were involved? Yeah, so thinking about it from, um, I'll start with customer success as one of the stakeholders. The important part there is making sure they know what your support team is going to be able to provide to the customers. Um, if you think about it, they work directly with the customers right now. They're feeling their pain or hearing their feedback. So you want to make sure that what you're going to do is actually going to address the needs of those customers. Um, a lot of the times they're getting feedback that your support team doesn't get or that anyone else doesn't get. And so you want to make sure that you're tapping into them as a resource. Um, from a sales perspective, they're probably one of the more important ones because if you have an SLA that you're in, tied to in terms of contract, 
you need to make sure that you're able to meet that. And so if they're selling a package or you're planning on selling a package in the future that says we will respond within X hours, um, you have to have the team that matches that. So you need to make sure like you're lined up with them. And that kind of ties into legal as well. Okay, cool. That all makes sense for step one. So let's move on to step two. So that was reviewing your current resources. So can you just tell me what all that entails? Yeah. So for me, um, when I think about that, you're going to break it down into two buckets. So you've got your systems and tools as bucket number one, and then your people um, as bucket number two. So thinking about that, you're going to need to know for your systems. Um, again, are you? do you have a phone system? Do you have chat and email? Um, do you have a direct line that is US-based, or do you need an international number or something along those lines? Um, and when you look at your people, really important there is just understanding do you have enough to cover time zones? Are they in specific time zones right now? What is their location? Uh, and also probably more important than that is, do you have the leadership structure to be able to match those needs? If your team grows or they expand to other regions, like, are you prepared for that? Okay. So when you were doing this or as you're doing this at Drift, did you have to hire more team leads or other managers to cover those new time zones as you were expanding to 24 seven? Yeah, so actually that was one of the first things I did was identify just leadership gaps and where we had and just needed to be able to fill those. Um, so I started with hiring a direct manager who was gonna help expand us in terms of our international coverage. Um, I got to the point breaking down the structure to have in uh, an EMEA manager, an APAC manager, and then just a standard um, North American hours manager so that I could kind of cover all of our key components there. And looking at it, it was one of those things where um, I, I had the option to hire externally um, and look at you know different people also for promoting internally. And we kind of did a combination of the two. I'm curious, as you were thinking about uh, you know the people side of things, how did you decide um, for the folks you, you promoted internally, how did you decide that I guess they were the right person to work on this newly expanded model? Uh, honestly, a lot of it had to do with just their experience running support teams, just whether or not it was as a smaller, as a team lead, um, or just running kind of smaller projects like tiger teams, kind of, kind of tackling things. So, uh, looking at that, it was, did they have the ability to, you know, run through a process, create something that didn't exist? Um, did they have the ability already to, you know, push towards goals and metrics individually, as well as others on that team? Um, and so when I was looking internally that, you know, those components there um, kind of stood out in one particular individual who ended up becoming our EMEA manager. Okay. And kind of on the people note, um, I know you've mentioned to me before that as you're expanding to 24 um, seven, you needed to hire folks in, uh, in other areas. So not just, you know, within the office there in Tampa, but with in other areas of the world. So can you just walk me through what you did there and why? Uh, yeah. So we hired, ended up hiring um, two resources in London, as well as two in Sydney, Australia. Um, and the big reason that we did that in terms of hiring in-country to start with was we actually had a presence from a sales and customer success perspective in both areas. And the idea was uh, being able to kind of grow those offices. Um, we treated it kind of like a mini startup. If you think about it as you're growing and expanding your business, if you've got a smaller number of people in any satellite office, um, you want to treat it like you need someone who can wear multiple hats. And so hiring support in those regions, I knew was going to end up paying dividends because those people could end up doing professional services, onboarding, potentially move into a customer success role. Um, and honestly, like a highlight here is actually as we are having this conversation before it started, um, we promoted somebody from support in London to a professional services consultant role. So the exact idea that we had of building up the team structure there. Nice. That's awesome. Cool. Um, well, let's go ahead and move on to step number three. So that was choose your model. So tell me more about uh, what goes into that. So this one's um, probably the most difficult to kind of picture and just understand what you're doing. But um, when I say choose your model, it is going to be kind of, you know, 
a couple different options, but do you want everyone to work in your current location where you are? Um, do you want people to kind of follow, do the follow the sun model? So they are going to work while the sun is up essentially where they're located. Um, or do you want to go to a third party resource um, that can kind of help you supplement those? So you're going to have to kind of pick between those. Um, the reasons it's important to think about in particular, if you do one location, I'll use Drift as an example of having everyone in Tampa or on the East Coast, um, you start to run into the question of how are they going to cover overnights and how are they going to cover weekends? Um, you have to make that decision and go, is this the right model? There are plenty of people that I've worked with at my previous company, um, as well as other companies who prefer overnight shifts. So you might have a balance where that's actually a preference for your team. Um, but then you also have to factor in if they don't, uh, you know, what do you do there as well as kind of figuring out, do I need to pay kind of an off shift differential if I do work the team internally in that location, uh, overnight or on a holiday. Okay. Um, so, you know, as you were deciding, I think you said you were doing the follow the sun model there at Drift, right? Yes. Okay. So can you just walk me through how you decided to do that? Um, how you went about communicating that to your team? Um, yeah. And just kind of how you made that decision to go with the follow the sun model, as opposed to having people work swing shifts, overnight shifts and so on. Uh, yeah. So for me, it, it came from experience and I actually started out in my career in support, um, being one of those people who worked a swing shift. And so I had worked overnight from 5 PM until 4 AM, four days a week. And so I had the direct experience of knowing what is this like on your personal life? Um, and so I kind of knew that there are some challenges that go along with it. And so I brought that in while I was planning. Uh, but before I made a decision just based on what my preference was, uh, I actually pulled the team. I started asking them questions because I don't want to just make that decision. I want them to be a part of kind of building that and asking them, you know, do you prefer an off shift? Does anyone prefer that? Does anyone prefer, um, you know, weekend shifts because maybe it's an easier thing for their life? And you know, I got an overwhelming response that it, it wasn't something that they would prefer. They would do it. And even though I knew the team would, you know, do what was necessary, it wasn't going to lead to a positive cultural experience for them. And then um, my previous role, I did deal with uh, the idea of just retention. You're going to have an issue with people wanting to leave if they have to go on an off shift um, or if you don't have a large enough staff and you have to do a rotation, if they know that every eight, nine months, I'm going to go back on this shift. Like they start looking elsewhere if they're not a fan of it. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I know that retention is already kind of, kind of a challenge in the support realm. So I imagine you don't want to add any additional <laughs> stressors there. A hundred percent. I think the idea for support is usually a, a gateway to other areas of the company, which is a great opportunity. Um, but you want it to be one of those things where it's organic because something came up and they wanted to do it and they were prepared. Not that they're looking to do this because they just can't stand working at 2 a.m. anymore. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you mentioned that there were a few different options that you could have taken. You could do hiring in other countries. Um, you could do, open a new office. You could use a third party. So what, what kinds of things are you thinking through as you decide which route to go? Uh, so for hiring in other countries, if you're going to go that route, um, and that's a lot, of, a, a lot of companies, you know, want to expand their footprint and be around the entire globe. Um, what you don't take into consideration if you haven't run a team before is the legal implications. Like you actually have to figure out, do you have a tax entity in that country? Are you able to hire? Um, because that doesn't just happen overnight. So you actually have to start thinking, do I have the capability to do this? Um, if we're not doing this, is this something where I don't want to just make it a, a support function? Maybe I should bring in our sales and consulting team. Maybe I should bring in our product team and understand like, does someone else want to move into this location too? So um, you want to think bigger picture in terms of just, you know, who or where you're going to be going um, and not just think like, oh, I, I'm just going to hire somebody. I'm going to put an application out there and just figure that part out. Um, I would say the third party thing is also another kind of question that you have to ask is, is it going to change the experience for your customers? Um, is it going to benefit them or is it going to be a detriment? And what I mean by that is uh, if you have, you know, an overly complex or technical product 
um, hiring and training resources through a third party means you're going to have to kind of, you know, buckle up and figure out like, how am I going to get them ramped up as fast as possible? Um, because you don't want your customers to suffer because you're going that route. Uh, but then also just, you know, is there, are there language barriers or issues where you need to make sure that you're supporting in different languages? So you kind of have to ask a lot of these different questions about what does your customer experience look like before you can even choose like which model you go for. Okay. And so for you guys, the follow the sun model, hiring in additional countries and the regions you were supporting, that was the best option for you, correct? Yes. A big reason for looking at follow the sun for us was that idea that we already had those offices um, in Sydney and London. And so we wanted to help support them. Uh, So that was a big reason for following the sun and hiring in country. The other part was, like I said, internally, just the idea of what would the cost um, be for having to pay for overnight shifts, off shift differentials, but not just the cost in terms of financially, um, but the cost to your employee sentiment and that idea. So combining the two, it just made the most sense to kind of follow the sun. Okay. Um, so earlier you mentioned that as you were, again, thinking through which model to use, that you pulled your team, um, you asked for their input. So maybe this is too in the weeds, but you know, how exactly did you do that? Were you doing that in your one-on-ones? Did you ask them as a group? Was it a virtual poll? I'm just curious how you went about doing that. Uh, it was a combination. So the first step was um, kind of getting that message out which it's going to actually tie into what we're going to talk about for the step four, but the idea of letting them know what we were going to do and why we were doing it. Um, and then providing different options on the table, like letting them know like, Hey, this is something we could do. And then, you know, making sure it was part of um, just a mass message. We use Slack a lot internally. So I posted in Slack as well as sending an email. Uh, and then the other piece of that was having individual managers just ask in their one-on-ones what their, you know, the pulse of their, um, people are so that they can kind of understand like, what is it and why? Because when you send out a poll, you're going to get part of the story. Uh, And I think when you have that one-on-one conversation, you might get a little bit more in in the weeds and the details of exactly why they made a decision or didn't want to make a decision. Um, Like for instance, there was actually, I've I've had people on the team uh, who preferred overnight shifts. My, one of my managers right now actually prefers to work overnight because it's just better quality of life. Uh, and then I have another manager who prefers to work earlier because it's better for his quality of life with his kids. So, you know, you can't make assumptions, which is what I said before, you know, I worked in overnight shift and I wasn't the biggest fan, but I didn't want to just take that into consideration when I was making that decision. Right. Yep. Love that. I know I, when I was a newspaper reporter, I once worked a 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift. And while there were some benefits to that, um, it was not great on the social element. So I can see that's definitely different for everyone. <laughs> I did always like the fact that if you worked an off shift, it made it easier to get to appointments and you didn't have to take a day off yes. to go to the dentist or anything like that. Yep. If you have to run to the bank, you know, no one else is there during the day. So uh, yeah, there's pros and cons. Um, so let's, you know, with that, let's move on to step four. So this is the one that is all about communication. Um, so can you just tell me what all is involved in that? And again, why it's important and uh, how other support leaders can go about uh, executing it? Yeah. So uh, when I, when I thought about this step, um, I, I broke it out into kind of three categories of people that you're going to need to communicate with. And that is your team, um, your company and your customers. So thinking about your team, uh, specifically within support, they're going to need to know what's changing, how it impacts their life. Um, You know, if you're going to hire more resources, that's going to, you know, change, you know, what their what their day to day looks like, their shift could change. So you need to make sure that you're communicating internally as much as possible. Um, And I I think it it, it was a book that I had read before, but the idea of uh, what is it, who moved my cheese, just the idea like someone's going to ask questions if things change. So you need to make sure to address them before it becomes a problem or issue later. Um, The other thing, like with your team specifically, like I said, is processes are going to be different. They need to know, you know, if you're supporting, you know, 24 seven, like what does that mean for them in terms of who do they need to go to? Um, Does anything change? So don't just assume that, hey, you're going to change how you support your customers just means everything stays the same. Um, So you need to make sure you're able to communicate what those differences are. Uh, the company, the entire company looking at that, um, your sales team, 
un needs to understand what support is able to do. I would say, depending on your, your market, like that might be a differentiator. You might be able to say you provide true 24 seven support and other competitors don't. And so you need to make sure they understand what that is so that they can talk about it. Um, your customer success team needs to know when they're talking to their customer because they're gonna reference, you know, how to work with them and what hours or how that works. So just making sure they understand that piece. Uh, the legal and HR component and, you know, kind of security, they just need to know for compliance reasons. Again, just like, are you hiring in different countries? Um, what does this mean in terms of holiday pay or anything along those lines? Uh, and just making sure that, you know, you kind of adhere to any policies that you might have. Um, and the last one that you might not think about is your product team. If you have, um, you know, for us, software as a service is if you're supporting 24 seven, you might get emergency issues more frequently overnight and they may not be used to that. So you need to make sure that your teams are aware on product, but also that if you've got somebody on call and they're working this shift, you need to introduce them to one another. So you're not just saying everything stays status quo. It's like, this might be your overnight shift and these people are gonna be the ones who are paging issues all the time. Uh, so like make sure that they understand who their counterparts are. Okay. Um, um, and then how about the customer side of that? Yeah, I was gonna say that was the last piece. Um, <laughs> so your customers, it's extremely important and this change could look many different ways. Um, but probably the easiest is updating your company website. Like if you've got support hours listed there, you're gonna wanna change those. Um, I would also probably say if this is something that changed for your customer and they're getting a new experience, using email marketing so that they understand exactly what the differences are and why it's better and more beneficial to them. Um, and then just making sure that, you know, they understand if there's different ways to communicate depending on the time of day that they have all of those answers as well. Uh, typically speaking, if you just, you know, think about your support terms and conditions on a website, like that's the easiest way to go ahead and put that on there so that if something does change in the future, you don't have to worry about it. You can just update that page. Okay. So when you made this change at Drift, did you use email marketing? Is that kind of how you went about it? Uh, so for us, we had a, um, I'd say a semblance of 24 seven support. Uh, and so what we ended up doing for a lot of it was not necessarily email marketing, but we did update our support webpage to include what the different avenues were for contacting us. Um, and it eventually got to the point where it was no longer just existing on my support page. We actually released uh, the customer service plans and customer success plans tied to kind of what offering they get. And so we ended up updating all of that for their terms and conditions so that it was all part of one big story for the customer team. Okay. Nice. Um, so, you know, why is it important to communicate to all these different groups and to really place this emphasis on communicating? Uh, for, for this right here, I would say um, communication is key because people need to know what's happening in order to talk about it. Uh, the worst feeling in the world is when someone comes to you and says something and you had no idea that it, it happened. Um, or if they come to you and say, you know, I heard that you support 24 seven and you say, no, we don't, but you find out that you do like, again, like it's going to make you, if you're a customer facing look bad and you don't want to do that to anyone on your team. So the importance there is just, just visibility. So everyone understands that. Um, but specifically I would say on the different teams where they're going to interact, like the processes as they change because of the nature of your support, like people want to know what to do and how to do their job. Um, from a support perspective, you know, I can't, you know, over emphasize this, but like people panic when something comes up and you don't know, because you feel a sense of pressure to be able to answer a question or do something. And so making sure that everyone has all of the answers that are available, um, to them before and not afterward is critical. Yeah, for sure. I know I can definitely relate to that. Um, even on the marketing side of things. And I've heard from from other support leaders, like if there's not communication between, for example, sales and marketing and support, um, like if marketing sends a an email blast out and all of a sudden support gets all of these new tickets and they're not sure why, um, yeah, always better to over communicate, I would say. <laughs> I can't agree with you more. <laughs> um, so is there anything else that folks should know about um, how to 
execute this communication, how to really go about it in an efficient way? Uh, the big piece I would say for just your communication is going to be um, know how your company communicates. So for us at Drift, uh, we use, like I said, Slack, but we also use email for just you know following back up on that and then having an internal wiki or process page. Um, just make sure that whatever you do, you kind of cover all your bases. Um, and I'd say the documentation part of it, uh, where everyone can find resources, is probably one of the more important ones because they may not remember exactly what you said when you said it. So they need to be able to find that as a reference point. Um, and then I'd say the last thing, like utilize your resources for us with Drift Video. I can record a video and people can watch it uh, at their own time. They don't have to be there if I need to you know, have a meeting. I can just actually just record it and share it. Um, but the thing for that with me is you can actually walk through the resources if necessary. If there's an update to your company website, I could have it on the screen and talk through it instead of just having it as a bullet point. And I think just if you think about it um, as a former educator, the idea of people learn differently and respond differently. So just make sure you're covering you know, maybe auditory, visual, and just you know, their ability to read it as well. Yeah, I, I'm i glad you brought up your teaching background because a lot of your focus on on making sure that everyone understands the assignment um, and really focusing on processes made me think of your, your background as a, a math teacher, right? Yeah, uh, I taught math for <laughs> three years and I will say I bring that more into my day-to-day -day than most people would think when you're running a support team. Um, just the idea of that you need to Treat your, you know, your employees as well as your customers the same way that you would like a, a student in the fact that they're there to learn something or understand something and how do people best learn. Um, and so, you know, not everyone's going to think like you. So you have to start and go back to that idea of like, I need to make sure that there's different ways to approach this. Um, but also, I'd say probably the idea of being a teacher where you check for understanding uh, is often <laughs> forgotten. And so that part right there, I just stick with and go. Can, can you tell me what I said? Um, do you understand what we're trying to do? And if you can't, then I did something wrong in my communication and I'll just go back to the drawing board. Nice. I love that. And it's, it's funny, several of the people, the other support leaders that I've interviewed for this podcast have mentioned specifically that they love to hire teachers, like for this reason, because they are great at teaching anyone anything. Um, and But yeah, I hadn't thought through the element that you just brought up, checking for actual understanding. That's huge. Yeah, you, you would think that, you know, once you've gotten the message out, um, and this is where I'd say, like, you know, working with it, it's like you would assume that people would know it, um, but everyone knows what happens when you assume. So just the idea <laughs> of making sure that what you're trying to get across um, comes out. And uh, there was actually going even before teaching, there was a, an Apple retail term that they use where it was inspect your expectations and making sure that I, whatever my end goal is, um, when we're thinking about communication, do I want them to be able to understand how to do something, execute it or answer a question? If that's the case, then I need to build my training or communication to answer that set goal. So you have to actually think about what do I expect? And then you build everything from there. Nice. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's a cool superpower that you get to bring to your role. <laughs> um, well, now that I like took us off track there, um, to bring us back to the steps, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the final step, um, step five. So that is the reviewing process. So can you just tell me what all you're reviewing? And yeah, let's start with the what. <laughs> Yeah. So um, for me, I'm looking at what is the customer experience? Um, how are they impacted from this? Uh, what is your actual support team experience like based on the changes that you made? And then overall, um, what is the company experience the, throughout the different areas of your company? And like, how are they being impacted by this change? Okay. So how do you go about doing all of that? Um, for me, what I actually like to use a lot of the times, uh, well, first you have to collect feedback. You have to actually ask, you know, um, for some feedback from everyone who was involved in this process. Um, I use something called a four helpful lists, which is what's right, what's wrong, what's missing, and what's confusing. Uh, I like that one in particular because you're not just asking people, you know, did you like this or what could you do differently? Um, if you ask someone those four questions, 
then what you're going to end up getting is somebody who's looking at the entire scope of it and not just one part of it. Um, Because people are going to have issues where they might feel either upset or they might enjoy something. And if that's all they're thinking about, that's all you're going to get. But if you say, I need these four different questions answered, um, you're going to get a lot more feedback and have people start thinking about, you know, things that they didn't actually, you know, take into consideration before. And I think the one that's probably um, most often forgotten is what's confusing. It's the idea of what did you not understand based on either the message or what we're doing. And, you know, you'd be surprised by what comes up there and what you thought was crystal clear. And then you find out, oh, well, I guess I didn't do a good job of explaining it or I can see how that was missing or that was confusing. So you just kind of have to make some alterations there. Okay. Yeah, I love that. I like the concept of using those four questions. Um, so why, you know, why is it so important to review? Like maybe that seems like a silly question, but I, I suspect there's a good answer here. <laughs> um, for, for me, it's like the idea of like, did you really think that you were going to get it perfect the first time? Probably not. <laughs> Wouldn't like that be nice? <laughs> oh, I would love it if you just launched something and it never had any problems whatsoever. <laughs> um, that would be a dream scenario, but you know, that's not the case. And there's other things that you want to think about, um, about the impact to it. And when I, when I talked about your target audience, uh, the thing that you really want to think about is your support team. If they're going to switch and pivot to a 24 seven support model, um, you don't want to make their lives any more difficult than it needs to be. So you really need to get their feedback on here, uh, so that you can make changes, you know, and it's something where you want to look at it and go, what is their feedback? What could I change? What could I improve? Um, what do I need to keep doing? And then, you know, make a plan for it so that they can see that in action. Um, Cause it's one of those things where if you do something that's great for your customers, but it's, you know, you're not thinking about your internal customer at that point uh, it's, it's not going to have the same effectiveness if they are on board and fully support it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and now moving on kind of to the execution side of this, in addition to, you know, using those four questions to get in-depth, helpful answers, what are some of the other ways that you go about, you know, executing the review process, collecting that feedback, doing something with it, analyzing it, and so on? Uh, I would say the one of the things as well that I didn't touch on was just getting your customer feedback. Um, four helpful lists make sense for internal feedback, but another way you can execute for external is getting feedback directly from your customers through either a survey um, or leveraging your you know customer facing teams your customer success managers if they've got any direct feedback you know glowing reviews i'm so glad your team is available after hours like you know that's a way to understand it um i i wish that you were able to do x y or z uh and i think you know that's a good way to collect it directly from what is the phrase directly from the horse's mouth um but the survey mechanism I think is not leveraged enough. And it's something where uh, if you're very deliberate about it, you can get that feedback through support ticketing surveys or through chat surveys. Um, and that one, I'll be honest, like I took directly from uh, the Disney book, Be Your Guest. And the idea that the way that they surveyed was very intentional and they wanted to ask, you know, not just how was your experience, but, um, you know, they wanted to get specific bits of information. And it was through, you know, if they made a change, you know, did you prefer red or blue, like whatever the color could be? And what was your reasoning behind that? Um, they were very, you know, specific about what they wanted to collect feedback on. And I took that to heart from that book um, to the point where fun fact is like they spaced out their trash cans, specifically the distance where someone's willing to walk and hold on to a piece of trash before they what? throw it down. <laughs> and so like it's it's that meticulous, but you only get that if you ask the right questions. Hmm. And that was from, you said, a book? Uh, yeah, the book. What was the be, title of that? Uh, be Our Guest. Okay. See, I might have to check that out. I'm actually going to Disneyland here in a few weeks. Nice. So I'll pay attention to the space between the trash cans. Start looking at that. <laughs> I mean, if, if people see you just pacing it out, you know, they won't ask any questions. <laughs> They'll be like, oh, okay, she knows. Just like I know they, they paint some things a certain shade of green because it's the shade that you're least likely to notice, like if they want to hide something. So there's another fun fact for you. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> um, okay, and then is there, I know you'd also mentioned at some point leveraging your CSMs for that feedback, like in addition to the surveys. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? 
Uh, yeah. So um, in a lot of companies that I've worked for or worked with, um, the CSMs have direct contact with the customer, whether or not it's a regular meeting or it's just, you know, an impromptu conversation. And so um, making sure that you are asking your team, if you hear about any of this, let me know. Uh, because it's one of those things, too, where your customer success manager may not actually just consciously go, oh, they talked about support. Let me tell you know, Ben about what they said. Um, like You're going to have to get that from them and say, hey, we just launched 24-7 support. If you hear anything specifically about it, please let me know. And so um, you know, getting that word out to them, asking regularly, I would say when you first execute it, you're probably going to want to remind them, you know, um, on a pretty regular cadence, like weekly, bi-weekly, something just where you're saying, remember, if you hear about this, let me know because I want to know how it went. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It kind of ties back, I think, what was it, uh, one of your previous steps about just pretty much getting every single one of those stakeholders in the room from the very beginning. Um, okay, so kind of segueing into the next uh, section here. So now that we've gone through you know, each of your five steps. Can you tell me about um, a time that you have used this five-step process to expand to a 24-7 model? Yeah, actually, uh, I've got kind of a couple different stories with it um, to kind of talk through would be a time where we executed it, but also a time where you kind of made a change based on some of the assumptions. So I kind of want to use both. Um, All right. But thinking about at Drift, you know, coming into it, uh, we were primarily an East Coast company, um, and you kind of looked at the idea of, you know, supporting our customers. We wanted to be able to support them, you know, where they're at, the idea of eliminating friction. Um, but one of the first things that I actually looked at when I talk about, like, you know, asking your key stakeholders, uh, we had an office in California. And so my support team wasn't necessarily online during hours to even support fully that office. And the idea was like, well, that doesn't make sense. So, you know, thinking about that stakeholder concept, I asked, you know, just everyone involved, what would it mean internally? Um, and then also externally, like, what are we going with from a, I guess I would say, service package model? Like, what are our goals with that? And so kind of lining those two up, it made, made perfect sense to go with, we need to expand our support. Um, and then as we were thinking about those decisions, like I said, the idea was we, we realized we had an office already in London. So I had hired before internationally. I was like, this makes sense to kind of give them the ability to have a resource in office. Uh, the one where we didn't quite have a footprint yet was Australia, but I also knew that we didn't have a lot of volume at that point during those hours. So it wasn't the most pressing thing. Um, so when I thought about it, it was, well, I'll, I'll wait. I'll put that one on the back burner. Um, but it just so happened actually as a company that we started hiring for sales in that region. So I said, Okay, well, let me get my first support resource there. Um, so looking at that, we ended up going through that model and interviewing and hiring there. Um, this is where I would say the, the legal side of it came into um, play where you're not thinking about it was because sales was hiring there, I already had an in and I knew that we had that tax entity, so I didn't have to go there. Um, nice. <laughs> but I also know like here in the States, like if you're going to go hiring remote, like I also had to understand where did we have tax entities. So I had experience with not being able to hire candidates in certain places. So I already knew like check that off my list before I get there. Um, but once we did that, actually, uh, so going through everything, getting down to the communication phase, um, this is something that I absolutely love about working at Drift is uh, we do something on Fridays called show and tell. And so you have the ability to show your work, share it with everyone. Um, and so the idea of like, what are we doing from a support model and, you know, being able to show like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how support's going to work and um, letting everybody see that. It was a good way to communicate that. Uh, but also, like I said, internally, like we built wikis, we did all these different things so that everyone had the resources there. Um, and then kind of pivoting to that last step of reviewing. There was so much feedback when it first happened. And I will say there. There were, there were some missteps in the idea of, um, you know, pe people who work these off hours, like what do they do? Like who do they contact? And um, I didn't map everything out fully for them to understand, like who am I supposed to reach out to? And it's like, okay, you know, document this, check this. If this person is not available, ask this person. Um, and then, you know, building out your systems and tools, it was I would like my team in London to work for customers in that region. So I need to update my system so that it routes to them. Um, same thing for Australia. And 
you would think, okay, well, you know, this should be a pretty easy thing, but depending on your system, you're going to have to make some changes. So like we ended up adjusting the way our queues worked and who they routed to so that it was easier on the person doing their job instead of them having to comb through and go, oh, this one's not in Australia. Oh, this one is. Oh. Let me work that one. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> the other story... Uh, but... um, Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. No, the other story that I want to talk about was when uh, at my last company, um, we actually had the overnight shifts, like I said, because I had worked on one and we had that model where in-house in Tampa, people were working overnight to cover um, our EMEA and APAC regions and weekends. And one of the things that I had adjusted at the end there was, you know, hiring in country, having that true fall of the sun. And a lot of it had to do with that feedback of people that I got, like I said, who didn't want to stay on that shift. Um, and so I kind of had to look at that same five step process, but, um, I, I had the luxury of, we already technically have full coverage, so I'm not having to implement, you know, some of the processes in place that, you know, you're going to have to do when you start from scratch, but I did have to adjust, okay, well, how do you hire in bulk in a region? Um, and so you had to look at, you know, am I going to hire one resource? Well, you know, if one person's there, it's going to be harder to support. And so. Um, you have to start thinking like, how many should I hire so that I can get the adequate coverage? Um, and how do I supplement it while I am actually, you know, getting these people ramped? Cause I can't take everyone off of this shift if these people aren't ready. Um, so you had to build a nice transition plan, but eventually we got to the point where we had a full office of support team members in London and another full office of support team members in Australia. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's, I mean, I already knew that this was a complex process, but there are a lot of moving parts. <laughs> there's, once you get yeah. into it, there's a lot. When you first think about it, it's uh, you're like, oh, 24 seven, I just shift sometimes and I'm easy and I'm ready to go. Yeah. Until you, yeah, figure, factor in the systems and all the HR stuff. Like it makes a ton of sense now that you've said it, but I didn't even think about the the HR and the legal side of things. Your best friend in this whole process for me was a uh, world time buddy. If you don't know that resource and you go online and look up world time buddy, it'll help you convert your time zones into the different regions that you're going to be in. Um, I, even with a math background, I've just never been good with time. So I relied on that heavily to just make sure I knew like what were the differences in time zone coverage. Nice. I just wrote that down. Because I Stonely is also an international team, so I like to know what time it is for my colleagues in Poland and France too. They have a mobile app too. Oh, nice. Um, so I guess on kind of on that note of you know this is a really complex process. There's lots of moving parts and different factors to consider. Um, what advice would you give to other support leaders who? you know, are either thinking about moving to a 24 seven model or maybe they're right in the thick of it. Uh, the biggest bit of advice I would say is just use your resources. When I say that, I mean like people, um, ask other companies that have done it before, reach out to support leaders on LinkedIn or Slack or anything along those lines. Um, and just find people to talk to because they've probably gone through the challenges that you're going to run into so that you don't have to. Um, I think that's probably one of the things that people don't do enough in terms of your business and career is just networking. Um, ask as many people questions as you can. Just reach out to anyone who's willing to answer. Someone's going to answer to try to support you. All right. Uh, perfect. Um, well, it's probably a good place for us to kind of start wrapping up. But before I ask you my last question, is there anything else uh, on this topic or about your five steps that we haven't covered yet that you'd like to add? No, I think it, I mean, we pretty much covered it. Uh, I would say just the big thing with it is uh, from my teaching background, just make sure you're organized and document it um, because you're not the only person involved in this process. So you're going to need other people. So just try to make sure you document as much as you can. <laughs> Love that. Love that bringing in that teacher background into it. <laughs> um, okay. So for the final question, this is kind of our, the big one I like to ask every support leader I talk to. Um, but in general, what advice do you have for up and coming support leaders? The biggest bit of advice that I would give to anyone is just understanding that your people are your greatest resource. 
Um, it's not going to be any tool or system you have. It's not going to be your product. It's the actual people on your team. Um, because if you think about it, if they're, if they're not there, you're going to have to do that job. So like you need them to be able to function. Um, so treat them that way. Treat them like they're the most important. Uh, the best thing someone ever told me is um, when someone comes to you to ask a question or get your advice, give them your full attention because you don't know if turning them away at that moment, you're going to lose them forever. So just make sure you drop what you're doing to support them. I know it's different digitally, but like in an in-person environment, it was the, always the idea of like, turn away from your computer, have that conversation. Um, if you're in a Zoom call, like don't be typing and clearly not paying attention. Just the idea of they came to you for a reason. And if you show them that respect and treat it that way, like people will go that extra mile for you because they understand that you're already doing that for them. Oh, I love that. It's a great point. People are the greatest resource. <laughs> um, cool. Well, Ben, thank you so much again for taking the time to talk with me today. I think we got lots of really good information out of this episode. I'm really excited for for people to experience your five steps. So thank you. It was again. definitely a pleasure, Meredith. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Um, before I let you go, if if anyone listening or watching would like to uh, reach out to you or learn more from you, um, doing that networking thing you mentioned, uh, what's a good way for them to do that? Uh, feel free to message me on LinkedIn. Uh, I respond to a lot of those and actually it doesn't matter what kind of questions you have. I'm more than willing to answer them. Um, but also just if you find me on there, like you can shoot me an email, like just however you want to do it. And uh, I'll make sure to share with Meredith what my email is so that anyone who wants to message me, I'll go ahead and answer those questions. 